Hello, everyone. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Daryl Carter, the CEO of Avanath Capital Management. Avanath specializes in acquiring multifamily apartment communities across the U.S. And since its establishment in 2008, the firm has acquired almost $4 billion worth of properties in 15 states. Notable purchases include a high-rise in New York, $401 million, two properties in California, $432 million, and a recent acquisition in Chicago for $119 million, which is among the largest deals in the city. How are you doing today, Mr. Carter? I'm wonderful, Tony. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. So let's get right into it. Could you share a little bit about your background and how you got into the real estate industry? Well, uh, I grew up in Detroit, uh, on the west side of Detroit, 60s and 70s, baby boomer. And, you know, the beginning part of my childhood, my city was flourishing. My dad was an auto worker and, you know, there was prosperity. And then when we kind of got to the seventies, it started going the other way. And what, you know, what had happened was, you know, there was just basically uh, a lack of investment in that community. And, and so I saw what that did to my community growing up. And I, I always liked construction. I could not pass a uh, a construction site without stopping and watching. And so I was always interested in buildings. And uh, and then, you know, I, I started my career. I went to attend at the University of Michigan, played basketball there, then went to graduate school at MIT. And then I started out in banking. And my career has really been focused on strategies for investing in communities like my old neighborhood that have been underserved by institutional capital. I've had the th- general investment thesis that if disinvestment drives communities down, if you can make the right investments in communities, you can bring them up. And we've, you know, we've deployed almost $4 billion in communities across the U.S. and uh, West Oakland, south side of Chicago, Detroit, North Long Beach, South Central Los Angeles. And we have shown that when we, we make good investments in housing in communities that have been underserved by capital, particularly communities of color, it attracts more investment and it can change those communities. And so that's been a key part of our investment thesis. And uh, we've been very blessed to um, find an investment community out there of institutional investors that like what we do. And we have generated attractive risk-adjusted returns, and we've made positive impact on on communities. So that's, you know, that's kind of a nutshell. You know, people say, wow, you guys are having lots of success. And I like to point out that, yes, I'm an overnight success because I've been at it. This is my 42nd year, the last 30 building two companies. So, uh, you know, I, I consider myself definitely the tortoise and uh, you know, and in, in investing, you have to take a long-term perspective and have to have a long-term strategy. It's not get rich quick. Right. And as someone who's been in the industry for, you know, as long as you have, what are your thoughts on the current state of the affordable housing industry and what are your predictions for it going forward? We have an issue in this country on a housing affordability. And the main reason that we have that is that we do not have enough housing of all kinds, affordable housing, luxury housing. I mean, and, and Wall Street Journal had an article yesterday and, you know, there are different pundits that say we are under, we are short two million to eight million um, housing units across the country. Somewhere in that number is true, but we definitely have a shortage of it and particularly housing that serves people that are are at 50 to 100 percent of area median income which is very very difficult to you know there's a shortage of that and so the state of 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 affairs and in affordable housing today there is considerable demand and we have an undersupply so the fundamentals of the business are, are are doing well but we have to do something to address housing affordability uh, in in many communities across this country, because often people are paying 40, 50, 60 percent of their incomes in housing, and that's just not sustainable. And it, you know, and it it leads to bad health outcomes because people don't 
have the money to pay co-pays to get checking, you know, to get a checkups and things. So it's an issue that that has to be addressed. I think it's an issue that there is consistency across the country politically that we have a problem. But, you know, what what we get sort of um, hamstrung by are the competing solutions and what are the right things to do. But everybody, I think, you know, you can go to Washington. I spend a lot of time there with with uh, members of Congress and the Senate and the administration. And I think everybody understands the, the nature of the problem. It's just the solutions that we sometimes, um, you know, disagree on. Right. And how do you balance your investment goals with your commitment to providing quality housing and services for the residents in your communities? Well, I mean, I think they're hand in hand. I mean, you know, I always tell our, our team, look, if we just take care of our residents, we're going to make, an, you know, we're going to make money. We're going to make an attractive return for our investors. We're going to create opportunities for our team members, you know, our 500 plus team members. And, you know, so number one is taking care of our residents. Um, when you look at affordable housing traditionally in communities of color, and people say, for instance, that Section 8 tenants are bad. Well, my God, you know, and that's 40% of our residents. What we have learned is the perception of Section 8 tenants are reflective very often of poor owners and management companies and less on the tenants. And 40% of our families are um, Section 8 households. And, you know, they are pursuing their American dream just like anyone else. Um, hardworking people and very often two income families and people say, well, why do they get section eight? Because they both work at Walmart and they live in LA. And that's the situation. And one of the things that there is a stigma about things like that and investing in affordable housing and, uh, you know, and, and the like. And one of the things we like to believe is that you know, those stigmas are really not correct. Uh, you know, and you go to other countries. I mean, we have been blessed to to attract investors from Germany, the UK, Switzerland, the Netherlands. They have very similar programs, and most people there, when you describe Section Eight, they say, "Oh, that's good," because we have programs like this in in those countries. But mm -hmm. the you know, but. We get so many things in our U.S. housing policy twisted in with housing like matters of race that when you take them out and look at the fundamentals, like just most people in Germany get some level of housing subsidy if they make, say, under 75000 a year. And it varies. And, and they may live in a building with, you know, people making twice as much. And no one knows what anyone makes. And, you know, but that's the way... Um, th that seems to work well. And again, we tend to stigmatize affordable housing in certain communities that, you know, it really isn't, shouldn't be about that. Right. How would you say, or could you speak on your strategy when it comes to attracting institutional investors? And how have you managed to leverage those relationships to build the size of the company that you have to date? Well, you know, it's it's the the the, the holy grail in b building a business in the investment world is raising capital, and I think you know it, it probably incorporates at least three elements. Number one, first and foremost, is generating an attractive return for the investors. That that's one thing. And people say, well, how you know what are the th what are the elements of raising capital? That's one. The second thing, something that is highly scalable. People like investing in things that are profitable, but people are attracted to things that have scale, the ability to, to grow. I mean, people want the next Facebook, they want the next, you know, TikTok or whatever it is. I mean, but something that will grow with scale. And, um, and I think that the, the, the increasingly today, people want to make an impact, people who invest, they want to get also another bottom line benefit of having a positive impact 
on the community and also the environment. We're, we're focused very much on making our properties more energy efficient, you know, greener, and our investors want to see that. And so, you know, I think those are the elements, you know, attractive returns, the ability to scale, and making a positive impact. I would say underlying that, there's a whole lot of things that about, in, in, you know, in institutional investment of building the infrastructure of financial reporting, risk management, and those elements, which are equally as important from a kind of quality of life perspective for our investors. I mean, you know, quarterly reports are due a certain day and you just got to get them done and they have to be correct. And a lot of people sometimes under, underestimate the investment that one needs to make in technology, accounting systems, and people to appropriately manage and, and to attract institutional capital. Um, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, you, you it, it's a day-to-day -day lifestyle issue for our investors and their staff is to making sure that, you know, uh, our reporting is accurate and, 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 and also timely. Thank you. Switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about some of the strategies that you've implemented and what your thoughts are on what other affordable housing investors can do to kind of position themselves for success in this economic climate. Well, the one thing, probably the biggest strategy, Tony, we've we've employed is we, we look at investing not only in brick and mortar, but holistically in the lives of our residents. And and I'll cite a couple of things. I mean, we own um you know, we, we have properties that are, have large, that they're family oriented with lots of kids. Um, most people work and very often the school bus pulls up and there's no parents at home. So we do at a lot of our family communities, we do after school programs. And, and we do that because the parents like it, the rest the kids are in a safe place. Uh, we will generally find a nonprofit that we bring on site to operate it. Um, but that becomes something that parents like, and it makes the property safer, drives down the maintenance costs. It translates to occupancy and minimizes turnover. So we do a variety of things like that. <clears throat> we own um, about a quarter of our communities are age-restricted seniors communities, which are all independent living. And uh, for, for those communities, we are very um, focused on wellness. If we can make our seniors healthier for a longer period of time, then they can maintain independent living, that they don't need assisted living or higher level of nursing care. So wellness has been important. Um, so again, that's and, and, that, and that translates our wellness programs where we do um, fitness classes and things like that, uh, but also we will help organize farmers market to bring fresh, you know, vegetables and produce to, to some of our communities uh, that are underserved by retail and, and supermarkets and quality um, food outlets. Um, but again, that's to promote long-term health where, again, it translates to higher occupancy where our residents can live there longer. Um, we recently, um, you know, took on a, a, a program that is sponsored by a very talented uh, startup company, uh, a, a couple of guys who started it. Uh, uh, it's called Asusu. And what it does, I think you interviewed. Um, uh, I mean, yes, with Memo mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, they, that is a great company. They do of course, data analytics, we have, I think we have two or 3,000 of our apartment units. And what they do is they report on-time rent payments to the credit agencies. And, and you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, and this has been a big, I've been involved in at the National Multifamily Housing Council as a former chair, but also a board member, where we have, you know, w when you look at probably 10 years ago, when you look at the analytics of some of the big credit agencies, you know, car payments, 
um, uh, uh, installment sales from from stores and, and the like were higher weighting, given higher weighting than rent payments. Rent payments, you know, obviously mortgage payments are very, uh, uh, they're, they're very, they're always reported to credit agencies and that's why homeowners move their credit scores up. But people who pay rent on time, they don't, they had historically weren't getting the benefit. And when you look at the discrepancy between minority um, home ownership rate versus whites, that that basically created this this incredible what I call this this uh, cr you know this credit ghetto if you will of not being able to raise scores. <clears throat> With what we have what we have been you know on the 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 properties that we have enrolled and we have again about two or three thousand households. One which was amazing. There were probably four hundred people who had no credit history they were ghosts on the 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 credit scores they now have a credit score so you have a heavy presence on the west coast and on the east coast of the country are there any other markets that are of interest to you at this point in time well we're, we're always very deliberate when we go into a new market the last new market we went into was boston and Boston has many of the same elements that, you know, some of our other markets, Seattle, uh, Denver, you know, very, very high housing prices and lots of, when you look at Boston, all the universities and things, which, you know, most people don't realize. I mean, one of the challenges at many universities is that not student housing, but people that work there. So, um, Boston was the, are the the last market we entered, and of the places that the urban areas that we're looking at that we're not in, probably our number one that that we're kind of looking to two that we're looking at uh, would be maybe Nashville and Atlanta. Lots of growth, um, great employment, um, lots of. Um, you know, great airports. I mean, that's a key element in places, um, you know, and great job growth across a variety of sectors. Uh, so, you know, we're in Orlando, we're in the Carolinas. So Atlanta is probably that place that we are in, in Nashville, because again, lots of great stories in those, those cities. Um, and again, we think that, um, you know, and 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 those all those cities need more affordable housing. So, I mean, and you know, you think even places like my hometown of Detroit, where it's basically a relatively affordable city, but there's still a need even there um, because there's just not enough of it. Hmm. Quality affordable housing. Sure. When you think of building a company that is uh, of the size that yours is right now, what would you say are the top, let's say, three to five personal characteristics that an entrepreneur would need to have? Number one, which no one ever likes to hear, is the P word, patience. <laughs> <laughs> it's inconsistent with the nature of an entrepreneur. And it, it's one that certainly did not come natural to me. I did not have it in my 30s as an entrepreneur, but I've over time, I've developed it. Um, probably number one th attribute is patience. After that is, you know, learning how to attract and build a great team around you. And in building a team, it's really important. I mean, I know we talk a lot about diversity, but th there is nothing <clears throat> that is more important than having when you're sitting at a table and you're debating or you're deliberating something to have a variety of views because everybody sees the world differently. And it's great to have that perspective. And, <clears throat> you know, I remember early on in my career, you know, one of my, uh, I was evaluating a real estate project and I can't even remember the city, but my, my boss sent me there, look at it, and he asked me, did I feel safe? And I said, yeah, I was safe. 
And then he just asked me a question. He said, um, would your sister, you have a sister, which I, I have two. And he said, well, would they feel safe? And I said, I don't know. And the point was, he said, look, Daryl, you're six foot seven, six foot eight. You're going to, and you grew up in Detroit. You're going to feel safe a lot of places, but you're, you know, you have to look at the perspective that other people and someone older, someone younger, they may have a different perspective. And, and, and our business is like that in that, you know, um, you know, we, we will deliberate things, you know, like when we're doing renovations and, you know, should we put the, 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 the workout room, should we, should we build a new workout room or not? And, and we go back and forth, but having diverse perspectives is very important in building a company because you don't want to have everybody that thinks like you. And, you know, early on in building this company, I had, you know, I mean, I, I particularly listen to some of our younger um, uh, team members who come up with ideas and things and, you know, early on, one of our younger leaders in our property management business came and said, hey, Daryl, I think people in affordable housing rely much more on technology than in higher income properties. I didn't believe that, didn't agree with that. But we then created, uh, and, and he told me why, and, and he said, look, in communities, he said in most of our communities, but particularly where English is not number one language of the family mm. who comes to see to the rental office generally the kids why because they speak english they're home at a t you know they they're before school or when they come home and they all have smartphones you when they come to our rental office you load an app on their phone they're not coming back they're going to use it when there's a maintenance issue I say mom and dad here's how to do it and they do it and so Part of as a leader is getting out of your own biases and having an open mind to other people who may see things that are very different. And so I think those things and, and you know, and, and, and being, you know, so to me, those are the two most being patient and surrounding yourself around people that, you know, are different. And then also, you know, the, the big thing is time management. I mean, you know, where you spend your own time on and, we all like to gravitate. I mean, I would spend a hundred percent of my time on our with our acquisitions team, buying property and making investments because I love that, and that's you know. But you know, we have lots of great team, you know, team members in my accounting team, technology, and I have to spend time and understand what they're doing, and making sure you allocate yourself appropriately to the right places and thinking about what are the things that only you can do or what can be delegated and try to delegate as much as possible and then focus on the things that are really mission critical, like, you know, new businesses and new endeavors where I'm always looking at new things and how do we make ourselves either more efficient or larger or, you know, just improving what we do and, you know, where, where we do certain things, looking at geography and, and uh, which is, you know, you look at our business of, there's a lot of different aspects of it. And then you have different geographies. And sometimes it's like three-dimensional chess figuring out, okay, should we have um, these people here or centralized? And, and so that's always something that as a leader, just, you know, Looking at the organization and, and looking not only as to where the organization is today, but where you want to go. And I'm always thinking about, you know, we're at 16, you know, we'll probably hit 17, 18,000 units by the end of the year. And so what what does our company look like if we're double, if we're up 30,000 or 40,000 apartment units? How should we be shaping so we can achieve that? And so it's not managing for today, but also managing for the future. And you mentioned something that was very important. In addition to companies like Asusu that are making real estate, I guess, uh, more tech enabled and apps that your residents might find useful. Are you 
paying attention to any other type of uh, startups or that are in the prop tech space and how technology can be used in other ways to improve what you're doing? We look at everything. We look at a lot of things. And I actually enjoy looking at things and trying to imagine, you know, how, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we, we continue to look more. I mean, we don't um, do a lot of digital locks, but we're looking at different applications. I mean, it's interesting that the hotel, I try to, occasionally I go to hotel conferences to see innovations in hotels because very often they end up coming to, uh, apartment communities or, or vice versa some end up there but um things like you know some of the the technology with um thermometers and di you know like the nest i mean we we're always looking at things like that so yes and, and really with the goal of making our business run more efficiently but also um better service for our residents i mean if we can do things where um, they can better manage if they live in, in Florida, you know, and they can manage their heat more efficiently where they can lower their energy costs, but not having to walk necessarily into a hot apartment at the end of the day. And, and so those digital tools also, um, you know, improve our resident satisfaction. So, you know, it's something that I think you know, that we look at a lot. I spend a lot of my time looking at, it, and I think that, you know, it's, um, and, you know, we've adopted a lot of technology and how we manage the business. And, and uh, you know, I have a, a vice president of applications who I'm always, he was always tutoring me on different things that, uh, that he's rolling out. And cause I want to learn it as well. I mean, you never get, I don't care who you are, but the, the, the as I always say, and I talk to my friends who own companies, I said, you should be learning everything from and including from your people who know more stuff about, you know, their areas than you do just to learn it, and just to understand better their job so you can make better decisions. Right. In our previous conversations, you definitely mentioned the intentionality that you have when it comes to inc including black owned businesses in your yes. ecosystem. <laughs> Could you speak a little bit um, about that and why it's important to you? Well, it's it's important because I do think again it, it's um, it's consistent with our values of investing in underserved communities. Um, my largest contractor is a company called TEC Construction. It's it's owned by one of the most uh, you know and and you know one of the things I always like to point out that and and uh, the uh, TEC is owned by a good friend of mine by the name of Tim Coffey. And it's not that Tim is black and a friend, but I think Tim is the best person in the construction industry. He is incredibly talented, was, a, was an executive at Turner Construction before he started his company. He's been in business for 30 years. You know, he's built, he's the, one of the largest minority contractor at LAX, the new, both new stadiums. And Tim just knows his business, but more importantly, you know, Tim is one of these people that, um, you know, he grew up in in Indianapolis and, um, you know, in the, in, in the inner city. And, you know, he and I will often go to, um, we're big sports fan and we have season tickets to the LA Clippers. So we'll go to a game and then we'll talk about something and we'll drive by a property at like 11 o'clock at night. Because he said, oh, I think you could do this. I said, I don't think you could do that, Tim. And he said, well, let's go out there and look. And we literally are out. And I'm sure, you know, most people don't do that. But, you know, that's, but but it, it, it's interesting. Um, Tim and, I, you know, he feels comfortable going into North Long Beach with me and looking and and, and trying to, you know, so to, to figure out how a solution that's better and, I'm not sure that the CEO of Turner Construction would be going to North Longwood Beach with me at at, at midnight. Right. <laughs> but uh, but still, I think it's important that you know we uh, a very good friend of mine who's a, a very is uh, Victor McFarland up in San Francisco. We're partners with Victor on a redevelopment of one of the oldest um, African American sponsored housing cooperatives that was started in the '70s. We're 
involved with a redevelopment. We manage the property uh, with with Vic McFarland Partners. Um, so you know we we collaborate. Um, you know we started a, a management company in um, North Carolina with a very talented African American woman, uh, Dion Nelson, Laurel Street Residential. And Laurel Street, uh, we now have a, a company called LSA Management, Laurel Street of Vanneth, where we are uh, managing some of Dion's properties, but also, um, you know, some of ours that are down there. Um, so it, it's important that, you know, we we build this ego, ecosystem of, um, you know, black and brown businesses that, um we can grow together and, and support each other. And I think that, you know, other communities do it. And, and I believe very strongly that uh, we can do it and we can do it and not sacrifice anything. I mean, this is not, you know, this is something that I'm dealing with the best and brightest. Right. Appreciate that. And, and, and you're part of that as well. You, what you do is very intriguing to me and and you know you your company you have very high standards you're very aspirational in what you're doing and and I applaud you in all the things that you're doing because I think you're part of that group out there that's making change and uh, so keep on doing it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the kind words. And in wrapping up, do you have any parting advice for the uh, real estate investors out there um, or entrepreneurs in general? Yes, you know, being patient and being persistent and, and recognizing that the hardest thing, raising money is not easy. You know, the first time when I, I started my first company, which was called Capri Capital with a high school friend of mine by the name of Quentin Primo. And Quentin and I, we literally, before anyone backed our company, we, we were looking for an investor and we had about 57 meetings. We not about, we had 57 meetings because <clears throat> I kept the list of them. And it was the 58th meeting that we had someone uh, say yes to us. And, you know, one of the things that's important to, to point out is that my first five or six, I was like, oh, these people are crazy. It's because we're black. It's because this or that. And I was just very, very negative. And, and probably, I don't know, meeting number six or seven, someone took the time to say, look, this is what's wrong with what you're doing. It's this, this, this. And, and you know, they, they were very thoughtful in it. And I said, you know, maybe the no's, we need to learn something from each no. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you approach something like that, and every time we had a meeting, we would walk away saying, oh, we've learned this. Now we might need to just do a little bit of an adjustment this way. So don't view rejection as, you know, rejection, but review it, you view it as it's part of your market research of making what you do better and better. So, you know, and, and a lot of times, again, people will look and say, well, you know, it's, it's, you know, people don't, don't want to invest with me because I'm black or this or that, or, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, <laughs> I remember having uh, a meeting with a, a, a private equity firm out of Columbus, Ohio, that uh, basically said, you know, we really like you. We like your business, but we don't like people that went to the University of Michigan. <laughs> we're Ohio State people. And, and they were they were being a little they were they, they, they gave us more legitimate reasons. But you never know. I mean, that's just as maybe a reason than. Uh, then your the color of your skin. So you know, again, I encourage particularly uh, my brothers and sisters that are black and brown to just have a a viewpoint of try to learn from whatever rejections you get. Thank you. Well said. And with that, thank you again, Daryl, for your time. Definitely appreciate it. Uh, kudos on all your accomplishments to date, and we'll definitely be staying tuned to uh, all the future plans you have coming up. Well. Thanks, Tony. And again, you know, keep on doing what you're doing because you're making a difference out there. Thank you. I appreciate it. You have a great day. Thanks.